Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Math 321. So today we're going to finish up Investigation 29, which is Group Isomorphisms and Invariants, and then we're going to start into Investigation 30, Homomorphisms and Isomorphism Theorems. So let's review a few of the important things that we learned last time. So, um, of course, the most important thing in this Investigation 29 was the definition of isomorphism. So let H and G be groups, and isomorphism is a bijective function phi from G to H, such that for all X and Y in G, phi of X times Y is phi of X times phi of Y. And that equation right there, that is said to be the, um, that is said to preserve the group structure or preserve the group isom or the group operation, because you can do the operation first and then the function, or you can do the function first and then the operation in either order. If there is an isomorphism from the group G to the group H, we say that G is isomorphic to H, and it's denoted with this little symbol right here. Then we had a theorem that we proved last time in an activity, uh, let phi be an isomorphism from a group G to a group H, then phi of A to the K is equal to phi of A um, quantity raised to the K for all A in G and all K in the integers. So that also works um, for when K is zero, the identity maps to the identity, um, it works for negatives as well. And then we had another theorem, uh, the last one we had, I think, the relation of group isomorphism is an equivalence relation on the set of all groups. And so since it's an equivalence relation, it uh, partitions all the groups into their own isomorphism classes. And so the set of all groups isomorphic to G is called the isomorphism class of G. Okay, so now let's talk about isomorphisms and cyclic groups. So when we talk about groups, we don't really care what the elements in the groups look like. We've already seen um, some groups where we called the elements by different names, like in particular the um, the dihedral groups. We started off with a different name for every element, and then we realized we could write them all just using two elements. Um, so we don't really care what the elements look like, but we only care how they interact with each other. So when two groups are isomorphic, their elements behave the same way, they interact the same way. So in that sense, two isomorphic groups are the same group. And when we talk about classifying a group G, we really mean determining which isomorphism class G belongs to. So in this section, we will show that the cyclic, or that any cyclic group of finite order is isomorphic to Zn, which is quite interesting. And as a result, there is only one finite cyclic group of each order up to isomorphism. So this little phrase here, up to isomorphism, that means there is only one finite cyclic group of each order if you consider the isomorphic groups to be the same group. Okay, so we're going to do an activity uh, to prove this. So go ahead and pause the video and try this activity, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this. So let G, which is equal to the cyclic group generated by A, be a cyclic group of order N in Z plus, so that means N is an integer. To show that G is isomorphic to Zn, we need to construct a function phi from G to Zn that is an isomorphism. So part A, what is the form of an arbitrary element in G? So remember G is generated by A, so that means the arbitrary elements look like this. Um, you don't have to use K, you can use another letter, but I'll just use K, where K is N integer. So this uh, group G, it is all the powers of A for all of the um, integer powers. Okay, and then B, there is a natural mapping phi from G to Zn. Based on your answer to part A, write down an equation to precisely define this mapping. Okay, so what I said in part A um, is that all of the elements of G look like A to the K, where K is some integer power. Um, so the mapping here that would make sense, I think, would be like this. Um, so phi of, let's see, a to the k would be the congruence class of k. Does that make sense? Because um, that's the only thing that really distinguishes the elements from each other is what that power is. Okay, so that is part b, and let's look at part c. Okay, so for part c, show that the mapping phi you defined in part b is a well-defined function. Why is this step necessary and important? Okay. So um, part C, we always need to ha have a well-defined function in order to have an isomorphism. In fact, it's not even really a function if it's not well-defined um, in the technical sense. It's not a function. We actually saw an activity like this last time, right, where we had a function that was not well-defined, and then even though it was a bijection and it did preserve the group structure, it still wasn't an isomorphism because it wasn't well-defined. Um, so we do need that. And 
uh, just to remind you what that means, uh, well-defined means if A equals B, so A and B are two representations of the same element, um, then they need to have the same output because one element can't have two different outputs. It's not a function otherwise. Okay, so we need to check that that is really the case. Um, so we said that phi was going to be like this. We said um, phi of a to the k is going to equal um, the congruence class of k in Zn. Okay, so let's say um, that we have two elements in G, I'll call them G1 and G2. I don't want to call them like A or B or anything because A already has a meaning. Um, so we'll call them G1 and G2 in G. And suppose these are actually the same element. Okay, so then um, G1 equals um, A to the K for some integer K because it's in G and G is the cyclic group generated by A. And then also, same for G2. I'll use a different power for G2 though, um, since it might be expressed with a different power. So we use A to the, I don't know, the I. Okay, now we said that um, G1 equals G2, so then we can say um, that A to the K equals A to the I. Okay, so where am I going with this? Um, so then if I apply the inverse of a to the k to both sides, I get this negative k equals the identity. Um, so a to the i minus k equals the identity. Okay, so what does that tell me? Um, so I'm trying to get to the point where I can actually plug uh, G1 and G2 into phi, but before I do that, um, I need to actually find out these properties about it, so it's going to work out to be the same element. Um, so if A to the I minus K equals E, remember that A is the element that generates the group, um, so the order of A is N. So since the order of A is N, this means so if I raise a to any power and I get the identity, that means I must have raised it to a multiple of n. So i minus k is a multiple of n. In other words, n divides i minus k. Okay, so how is this going to help me? Um, so this is actually going to, this is exactly what I need because then um, when I do uh, phi of G1, I get um, phi, that's phi of A to the K. And then, so that's the congruence class of K. And um, also when I do phi of G1, or G2, sorry, that's gonna be phi of A to the I, so that's gonna be the congruence class of I. And um, these two congruence classes must actually be the same because just abbreviating it there, because um, i is going to be congruent to k mod n, and that is because n divides um, i minus k. That's the definition of congruence. Okay, so we do see that this function is actually well defined because when I plug in the same element, even if the element is represented differently um, with a different power, I still get the same output from the function. So it is well defined. And then I'll do d on the next slide. Okay, so now I'll do D, prove that phi is a surjection. Okay, so um, we want to be able to take any element from the codomain and show that there is an element in the domain that maps to that. Um, so let's take an element from the codomain. So let, uh, let's call it, I'll just call it K again. Um, let that be in Zn. Then um, G is equal to the cyclic group generated by A, right? So that's just all of the integer powers. Um, let me use a different letter. That's all the integer powers of A. Okay, oops. So that means that A to the K is also in G. Okay, and then if I plug that into the function, so phi of A to the K, uh, I get the congruence class of K, 
which is that element in the codomain. Um, so this means that phi is surjective. Okay, so for any element in the codomain, I can find an element in the domain really easily, actually, um, so that I get that it outputs that element in the codomain that I started with. Okay, now let's look at E. So prove that phi is an injection, and hint is to consider um, what it means for two congruence classes in Zn to be the same. What does that tell us about K and L? We actually already looked at that um, on one of the previous parts, but I think we'll need it again here. Okay, so for part E, to prove that something is an injection, I always do it the same way. Um, so I'm just going to let uh, G1 and G2 be in G, and I'm going to suppose that they have the same output from the function. So I suppose that phi of g1 equals phi of, oops, pen is messing up. Okay, so I suppose that they have the same output, and then we need to show that g1 equals g2. Okay, so what do I know from the fact that uh, g1 and g2 are in g, and what do I know from the fact that they have the same output? Okay, so, um, since g1 and g2 are in g, um, g1 is going to be equal to a, I'll call it k, and g2 is going to be equal to a to the l, and this is for some integers l and k. Okay, so I'm just using the same letters as the problem um, hint. Okay, so then um, since phi gives us the same value for both of these, so since phi of g1 equals phi of g2, uh, this means that uh, k congruence class of k must be the same as the congruence class of L. Okay, so I'm not to the end yet, though, because I'm trying to show that g1 and g2 are the same, so that a k equals a to the L. Um, so I'm not quite there yet. Um, so since... So this means that k and l are congruent mod n, like this. Uh, that means that n divides their difference, so n divides um, k minus l. So there exists um, some integer, uh, which I guess I'll call i in z, um, so that k minus l is a multiple of n, so k minus l is n i, like that. Okay, that's what it means for n to divide k minus l. And then now that I have that, I can solve it for k, isolate k, so this means k equals n i plus l. Okay, so remember I'm trying to show that a to the k equals a to the l, and now I've got k in an equation with l, so this is really helpful. Um, so this means that a to the k will equal a to the n i plus l. Okay, and I can write, I can separate that exponent like this, n times i, and then l over here. And then I can separate it even further just using my rules of exponents like this. Okay, and so since I'm raising a to the group order, remember n is the order of g, whenever you raise an element to the group order, you just get the identity. Okay, so this is going to be so e to the identity, or sorry, e to any integer is just e, the identity. Um, so this is just going to be a to the l. So g1 does equal g2. Okay. And now um, part f, I'll do on the next slide. Okay, so part f, prove that phi preserves the operation of g. In other words, prove that for all g1, g2 in g, phi of g1, g2 equals phi of g1 plus phi of g2. So over here, this is the, we're doing multiplication over here because that's the g operation. And then over here, we're doing addition because that's the z in operation. Okay, so that's why that's different on either side. Okay, so let's try doing this. So we're going to let g1 and g2 be in g. And then that means that they are some power of a because g is generated by a. So g1 is going to be, I'll just call it ak again, and g2, I'll just call it al again. You can use whatever letter you want um, for some integers uh, k and l. Okay. And then what happens if we plug them into this phi function together? 
let's see. So phi of a k a l. So I think I can combine those together, right? And make it into a to the k plus l. And then the output from there is going to be the congruence class of k plus l. Well, you know, with congruence classes, you can split them like this and do them separately in brackets. OK, so this is actually phi of a to the k plus phi of a to the l. And that is um, phi of g1 plus phi of g2. So we do indeed get that the um, function phi preserves the group operation. OK, so with that, we have proven theorem 29.18. Any finite cyclic group of order n is isomorphic to Zn. So that's what we did in the last activity. And then uh, there is also the following, although I'm not going to go through the proof of it. The proof is actually an exercise, so we might have that on the homework next time. Theorem 29.19, if g is an infinite cyclic group, then g is isomorphic to the integers. So that's quite interesting as well. All right, so the last thing in this investigation is Cayley's theorem. And uh, this is quite fascinating, actually, um, the statement of Cayley's theorem. So group theory, it actually originated as the study of permutations. And in fact, Cayley's theorem establishes that every group can be regarded as a group of permutations. So that's quite um, fascinating. You know, there's a lot of different groups. So there's the dihedral group, there's um, the alternating groups, you know, there's Zn, and then uh, direct products of, of Zn with other Zn's. There's all kinds of different groups, but actually they are all subgroups of the symmetric group, which is that group of all permutations of n elements. So let's see why that is the case. Okay, so we'll start with a preview activity, preview activity 29.20. So go ahead and uh, pause the video here and try this activity, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go over this. To understand Cayley's theorem, we need to understand how a group element can act as a permutation on a group. So let G be a group with identity E, and let A be an element of G. Define TA, so TA is going to be a function from G to itself, by TA of G equals AG. So this TA is going to be the permutation basically that is induced by A. And uh, so we're going to see that each group element corresponds to a unique permutation of the group elements. Uh, so let's try this out in this activity. Uh, part A, illustrate the definition of TA by determining the value of TA of x for each A and x in U8, which is the group of units in Z8 under multiplication. OK, so if you forgot about what U8 is, um, you get the units. Those are the ones that are um, relatively prime to the group modulus. OK, so this is going to be 1 and then uh, 3, and then 5, and then 7. So it's not a very big um, group. And then the operation there is multiplication. OK, so illustrate the definition. All right, so we're going to have four different TAs because there's four different possible values here for A. Um, so we're going to have T uh, sub 1. So let's just see what that does to all of the group elements. So that's going to be 1 times 1. It's going to be 1. All right, and then T sub 1 of 3. Uh, that's going to be 1 times 3, so that's just 3 again. OK, then there's t sub 1 of uh, 5. So uh, predictably, this is 5. In fact, it looks like t sub 1 is the identity permutation, right? Um, so the last one will be 7. And then that's not a square bracket. And then that'll be 7. So it looks like t sub 1 is just the identity permutation. Uh, then if we do t sub 3, this one will be a little uh, different. So that'll be 3. And then the next one, you guys can fast forward through this, honestly. <laughs> just um, stop when I'm talking about what this all means. OK, so this will be 3 times 3. That'll be 9. And then mod by 8, so that'll actually be 1. Oops, that should be a 3. So that'll be 15, and then we'll mod by 8, so that'll be 7. Oops, can't write these correctly. OK, so that'll be 21, and then we'll mod by 8, uh, so we'll take away 16, so that'll be 5. OK, so we got all four elements there. That's 
as expected, because when you make the group operation tables, you know, multiply by the same element, you get all of the different elements. Uh, each column, in other words, is, contains all the elements. Um, let me just do one more and then I'll stop. Let's see, so that's 25, and then mod by 8, and we get 1. And then this is the last one I'll do. So we get 35, and then we mod by 8 and get, um, uh, what would that be, 3? Okay, and then you can do the same for T7. Uh, so part B, what properties does the function TA seem to possess? For example, is TA an injection? Does it preserve the structure? Um, list and verify as many as you can. Uh, let me just move this over here. Okay, so um, it does appear to be an injection. Nothing appears to get mapped to the same element, and that would make sense as what I was saying. If you think about the group operation tables, um, each TA is basically like one row or one column of the table, and they should all have um, different entries. Um, what about a surjection? It does look to me like it's also going to be a surjection for basically the same reasons. And then um, as far as preserving the group structure, uh, that's a little bit hard to see. Um, let's think about this for a second. Um, we could just try like a small example and see. So for example, like t3 of um, 5 times 7, for example, is that going to be equal to uh, t3 of 5 times, oh my gosh, there's so many brackets here, <laughs> times t3 of uh, 7? Is that the same? Um, so, t so 5 times 7 would be 35, then if we mod by 8, that's t3 of 3. Um, And then on the other side, we get that t3 of 5 is, do, 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 where is it? This is 7. And then t3 of 7 is 5. Um, so if we finally simplify all of these, let's see, t3 of 3 is uh, 1. And then um, on the other side, uh, no, actually, I don't get that these are the same, because um, this is going to be 3, right? So that's a no. So it is an injection and a surjection, but it's not going to preserve the group structure. Okay, now let's try uh, activity 29.21. Um, so we're going to prove a couple of those properties from the last activity, and then we're going to talk about uh, TE and some composite functions and inverses. So go ahead and pause the video and try this, and uh, then we'll go over the answers. Okay, so let's go over the answers here. So let G be a group with identity E and let A in G define TA, which is a map from G to itself. So it's a permutation of G potentially, uh, be defined by TA of G equals A times G. So part A is TA an injection, verify your answer. Okay, so to verify this, uh, we need to let us start with two elements in G. So let G1 and G2 be in G. And we're gonna suppose that they have the same output so suppose that TA of G1 equals TA of G2. Then we want to see whether G1 and G2 are actually the same elements. So because of this, this means that A times G1 equals A times G2. So we can cancel. Remember, you can always cancel in groups as long as both are on the left to get G1 equals G2. So yes, it is an injection. Okay, so let's look at part B. Is TA a surjection? Verify your answer. Okay, so to prove that something is a surjection, I always start off by taking some element from the codomain. So I'm going to say let y be in the codomain, which is g. And then um, we want um, x in the domain, which is also g, uh, such that TA of x equals y. 
Okay, so let me do like a little sidebar, and this is not part of the proof, but this is just some scratch work over here. I'm gonna put it in a little cloud so you can understand that it's scratch work and not part of the proof. So let me just think about what um, should X be. Okay, because I have to like pick an X. Um, so what should X be? So I want uh, TA of X to equal Y. So that's gonna mean that AX equals Y. So can I just solve this for X? Well, yeah, I can. I can just apply A inverse to both sides like that. And then these are gonna cancel over here. So I just have X equals A inverse Y. And is that gonna be an element of G? Um, yeah, because A is in G, so A inverse is also in there, and then Y is in G, so if I multiply them together, um, it'll be in there. Okay, so let me just say all that up here. So since A is in G, A inverse is in G, um, and since A inverse and Y are both in G, um, A inverse Y is in G. So I'm going to let X equal A inverse Y. And then I just need to check that when I plug that in, it actually gives me y, okay? So then if I do ta of a inverse, um, oops, a inverse y, I get a a inverse y, which is just y. Okay, so yes, this is surjective. All right, part c, what specific function is te? Explain. Okay, so TE would be the function that would just multiply everything by E, the identity. So what function just multiplies everything by E? Whatever you plug into this function, it gets multiplied by E, so it doesn't change at all. So this is really just the identity function. Okay, so let me just show you. Um, this is the identity function because suppose um, it's not a P, so suppose uh, little g is in g, then uh, te of little g will be e times g, which will just be g. Okay, so it's just the identity function. Okay, so part d, if b is in g, the composite function ta tb, which um, I just noted here that that's the composition in that order, so it's ta of tb, uh, they're just writing it as multiplication, uh, has the form TC for some C in G. For, for which C is this true? So let's say, um, let's take two elements from, or sorry, let's take one element from G. So let little g be in big G. Then let's see what happens when we plug G into this composite function. So TA, TB of G is going to be TA of TB of G, like this. So the TB of G part, that will just be B times G. Okay, and then when I plug that into TA, that's just gonna multiply an A onto the front. So this is actually T sub AB of G, like that. Okay, so C is equal to AB. Okay, so that's interesting. You can actually just multiply the subscripts like that. Okay, so part E, what is the relationship between TA and TA inverse? Prove your conjecture. So my guess would be that, that these are inverse functions. Um, so let's just see if we can show that that's the case. So if they're inverse functions, then we need to be able to plug them into each other in either order and get the identity. Um, so let's see. So we just did in the last part, we showed that you can multiply the two subscripts together. So I'm gonna use that. So from part D, um, TA times TA inverse is going to be TAA inverse, which is going to be TE, which is the identity. That's from part C. So this is the identity function. Okay, and then also if I do it in the other order, then TA inverse TA, same deal, I just multiply the subscripts together, and that's also going to be TE as well. Okay, so these are inverse functions. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about groups as subgroups of permutation groups. 
So what we saw in the last activity there was that for each a in g, the function ta is actually a permutation of g because we showed that it's an injection and a bijection. So any, or sorry, an injection and a surjection. So it's a bijection. So any bijection of a group's elements um, from the group to itself is a permutation. It's a rearrangement of those elements. And so um, that means that we can identify each element in the group with a permutation of the group. So basically we can view the whole group as being a group of permutations. Okay, so um, in this activity here, we're just gonna formalize that a little bit more. So let P of G be the collection of all permutations of G and then let pi of g be the collection of all those little ta's that we were looking at on the last activity. Explain why this is a subgroup of p of g. So go ahead and pause the video and explain that, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this. So there's four conditions that we need to verify um, in order for this to be a group. So we need to verify that it's closed, and we actually did that on the last activity. Okay, so um, for all ta, tb in this permutation um, subgroup, pi of g, um, ta times tb, or ta composed with tb rather, uh, is equal to tab, which will also be in this um, permutation uh, subgroup, or subset, I guess we haven't proved it's a subgroup yet. Um, so that will be closed. Okay, then we need to verify that the identity is in there. Um, so we do have that t of e is the identity function. So that is the identity permutation as well, if we look at the function as being a permutation. And that is in um, pi of g. Okay, so we have that. And then um, associative, so function composition is always associative. Um, function composition. Is always associative. You can check it if you want, but it is. Okay, and then finally inverses. Um, so uh, for all ta in pi of g, um, ta inverse is also in pi of g and um, TA and TA inverse are inverse functions. Okay, so this is definitely a group. All right, so next activity. Um, so we're sort of building up to being able to show that uh, every group is actually a subgroup of the symmetric group. So in this activity, we're defining a little bit more machinery to let us actually do that. So this capital theta thing is gonna be the isomorphism that we're gonna show use to show that each group is isomorphic to the um, TA permutations uh, group that you can make from uh, all the elements. So we're gonna let capital theta from G to pi of G be defined by theta of A equals TA. Remember that pi of G, that's just all of the um, it's just all of those TA groups, or sorry, all the TA maps functions. Okay, so illustrate the definition of theta by describing theta from U8 to pi of U8. And one way to do this would be to specify what theta of G is for each G in U8. So go ahead and pause the video, try this, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go over this. Um, so if we're going from U8 to pi of U8, uh, let me just remind you that U8 is these uh, four elements. So it's one, uh, three, five, and then seven. And those are elements in Z8 that are units in the Z8. And it's under multiplication for the group operation. Okay, so what would theta of um, one be? So theta of one is just gonna be T sub one, um, where T sub one is simply, um, a map from G to, well, actually it's a map from U8 to U8 defined by um, so it's defined by this. If I plug in anything there, um, let's call it, let's call it X. I like X better. Um, then this will just be, I should put it in brackets. Like that. Then this will just be one times um, X. So that's what T1 is just in case you forgot. 
Um, and that's for all congruence classes x in u8. Okay, and then it's the same for all these. So theta of uh, 3 is just t3, and it's defined the same way, so I'm not going to write it again. And then theta of 5 is um, t5. Okay, and then theta of 7 is t7. Okay, so this theta thing is just um, it's taking our group elements and it's just spitting back out their little t maps. Um, and those all belong in the set pi of g. So pi of g is just all of, um, again, that's just all of the little TAs. Okay, so I hope this makes sense to you. There's like a lot of definitions um, at this point, but we're all gonna put them all together into the proof of uh, Cayley's theorem. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that proof of Cayley's theorem. And first the st statement of the theorem is, every group is a subgroup of a group of permutations. A profound and fascinating fact. Okay, so here we're gonna show that. So the proof, let g be a group with identity e and define theta from g to pi of g as before. So just uh, remind you again, pi of g, that is these ta maps for all of the group elements. They all have their own little maps, okay? And then uh, we will show that theta is an isomorphism. So first we need to show that theta is an injection. So to show that it's an injection, we suppose that theta of a equals theta of b for some a, b in g. Uh, okay, so since theta of a equals theta of b, that's going to imply that ta equals tb, since those are the outputs we get from the theta function. Okay, well, if ta is equal to tb, then that means that if we plug in the identity into each of those ta and tb maps, uh, then we should get the same thing, because they're the same function, supposedly. So that would imply that ae equals be, so that's this one is ta and this one is tb. Okay, so if a e equals b e, then a equals b. So that means that theta is injective. Okay, uh, next we're going to demonstrate that theta is a surjection. So we take an element from the codomain of theta, which is that pi of g group of the t maps. So we let t a be in pi of g. And then um, we're going to show that there is an element in the domain, which is g, such that it will give us t a. And uh, it's pretty obvious what it is, right? Like you just plug A into theta and that will give you the TA map. Okay, so we can definitely always find um, an element in the group that gives us um, an element from the codomain. All right, so the range of theta is gonna be pi of G. So theta is surjective. And then to complete the proof, we just need to show that theta preserves the operation in G. So let there be two elements A and B in G. We already showed in activity 29.21D that TA times TB equals TAB. So that means that if we plug in theta of A times theta of B, then we get TA times TB, which is the same as TAB, which is theta of AB, like that. So we've shown the three properties needed for isomorphism. So theta is an isomorphism. So that means that G is isomorphic to pi of G. And so that means that G is isomorphic to a group of permutations. Okay, and then what they mean about the they sort of didn't mention this part right here, the subgroup part. They really just show that every group is a group of permutations. Um, well, if if you've got pi of g, that's some of the ways of permuting the elements of g. It's not all of the ways. All of the ways of permuting the elements in g would be the symmetric group Sn, where n is the number of elements in g. Um, so that's why they put the little subgroup part in there. And we'll see that on the corollary right now. So here is the corollary. Corollary 29.25, if G is a finite group of order N, then G is isomorphic to a subgroup of the symmetric group SN. Okay, so that's what I was just saying. So G um, is isomorphic to some of the permutations of its N elements, um, not all of them. SN would be all of the ways of permuting the elements of G. Okay, so that finished up investigation 29, and let's start into investigation 30, which is gonna be homomorphisms and isomorphism theorems. So homomorphisms are like a really, really um, important technique for finding out different things about groups. So let's see what they are. Okay, so here is our focus questions for the section. What is a homomorphism of groups, and how is a homomorphism different than an isomorphism? What are monomorphisms and epimorphisms of groups? What are the kernel and image of a group homomorphism, and what properties do they satisfy? What are the isomorphism theorems for groups, and how do they use homomorphisms to establish relationships between groups? 
So recall that an isomorphism of groups is a bijective structure-preserving function. In group theory, structure-preserving maps are important even when they're not bijections. And that's the kind of maps that we're going to study in this investigation. So it'll be maps that preserve um, the group operation. In other words, phi of a times b equals phi of a times phi of b. So they'll have that property, but they won't necessarily be bijections. OK, so here's a preview activity to start us off. Um, so go ahead and pause the video and try this activity, and then we'll go over it. Okay, so let's look at part A here. Is the function phi from z3 to z6 defined by phi of uh, k sub 3 equal to 4k sub 6? Is that structure preserving? In other words, does it satisfy this little equation um, right here for all of the a's and b's in z3? And then is it an injection and is it a surjection? Okay, so let's investigate this. So first I'm going to check um, whether it satisfies that equation. So does phi of, well, let me start off by saying um, let a, I'm going to write them in brackets. I didn't do it before, but I probably should have. Let a and b be in z3. So let's investigate them. Um, what is phi of a, oops, I forgot them already. What is phi of a plus b? So I can combine the a and the b together in the brackets like this a plus b in brackets. OK, and then I'm just going to plug that into that function. Um, so that tells me to do 4 times a plus b and then put a 6 on the bottom. I should have put 3s on these, I'm sorry. 3, 3, 3. Oops, now I'm forgetting the b. OK, like that. Um, so that would be the left-hand side. And then what would the right-hand side be? So. Uh, phi of a sub 3 plus phi of b sub 3. So that would be um, 4 times a mod 6 and then 4 times b uh, mod 6. And I think I can combine these, right, if I want to. Uh, so this will be 4a and this one will be 4b. And then I can even combine them into one um, set like this, one bracket. OK, so these are the same. Uh, so yes, the structure is preserved. Now, um, is this an injection? So in order to be an injection, each element of Z3 would need to be mapped to a different output. So let's just check if that is true. Um, so I think I'm, the easiest way to do it is just uh, try all three elements, okay? So I'm going to do phi of 0 mod 3 is going to be um, 4 times 0, so that's going to be 0 uh, mod 6. And then phi of uh, 1 mod 3 is going to be uh, 4 mod 6. And then phi of 2 mod 3, uh, that would be 8 but then I have to reduce that mod 6 to uh, 2. So yeah, they all go to uh, different elements. So that is an injection. OK, now is it a surjection? OK, so it's actually impossible for it to be a surjection, and I'll tell you why. Um, that's because there's not enough elements for it to be a surjection. Um, surjection because um, the codomain has six elements. But the domain only has three elements. So you can't possibly map to all six elements from three elements. Does that make sense? OK, so that's part A. So it was structure preserving, and it was an injection, but it's not a cert. OK, so part B, we're going the other way around from z6 to z3. And then the formula is actually a little simpler. There's no multiple of 4 in there. So we're going to check the same three things. So is it structure um, preserving? Uh, so let's just check what is phi of um, a mod 6 plus b mod 6. Uh, 
So I can combine those into one um, element like this, a plus b mod 6, and then that's just going to be uh, a plus b mod 3. And then if I do the other side, um, so phi of a mod 6 by itself, and then phi of uh, b mod 6, uh, that's going to be a mod 6 plus b mod 6. Oops, that's, these are mod 3s, right? So this is going to be a plus b mod 3. Uh, so yes, it does preserve the structure. All right, now an injection. So it's actually, again, um, impossible because of the size of the two sets for this to be an injection. So this can't be an injection because we can't have all six elements mapping to six different outputs because there aren't six different outputs. There's only three things um, in the codomain. So this can't be an injection because the domain is larger than the codomain. So they can't all map to different places. Okay, and then um, surjection, let's think about that. Um, so we can just try plugging in some different elements and see if we hit all three of the possible outputs in the codomain. Um, so if I plug in zero, I get um, zero mod three. If I plug in zero mod, or sorry, one mod six, um, I get one mod three. And if I plug in uh, two mod six, then I get two mod three. Uh, so yes, this is a surjection. I hit the entire codomain there. Okay, let's look at part six. Um, so here we're going from z6 to z4, and we have got a coefficient there inside of the uh, brackets in the formula. So let's check the three properties again. So structure preserving. So let's check um, what is phi of a mod six. Oops, I'm trying to go too fast and mixing things up. Plus b mod six. So I'm going to combine the a and the b into one element like that. And then this is going to be uh, 2 times a plus b mod 4. OK, and then if I do the other side of that um, equation, so I do the phi uh, separately on each element. Oops, too many brackets. <laughs> Okay, so I do them separately like this, uh, then what do I get? So I get 2a mod 4 and then plus 2b mod 4 and then I can actually combine those and make it into one uh, like the first one. Um, so yes, this is structure preserving. Now is this an injection? So again, it's impossible for it to be an injection because uh, the domain is larger than the codomain. So I'll just write that. read that. Okay, now is it a surjection? Uh, so we can just check. So let's try plugging in the elements and see, because there aren't very many. Um, so let's see. So phi of 0 mod 6. Ah, this is going to kill me. Okay, that is going to be 0 mod 4. Phi of 1 mod 6. That is going to be 2 mod 4. Phi of 2 mod 6. Ah, is going to be um, 4 mod 4, but that is the same as um, 0 mod 4. Hmm, I have a bad feeling about this. I don't think it's going to be surjective. Okay, and then phi of uh, 3 mod 6. So that's going to be um, 6 mod 4, but that's the same as 2 mod 4. See why I have a bad feeling because we're only getting 0 and 2. <laughs> um, okay. And then phi of 4 mod 6, that is going to be um, 8, but we're going to reduce that mod 4 to 0. And so the last one then, um, obviously that's not going to be able to cover the two we're missing, which is one left. So this is not going to be surjective. 
So this will be 10 mod 4, and then that will reduce to 2. Okay, so no, we did not hit the wall. Okay, so with preview activity 30.1 under our belts, this brings us to the definition of homomorphisms. So we saw in that activity that it's possible to have structure preserving maps that are injections but not surjections, surjections but not injections, or neither. And such maps are called homomorphisms. So homomorphisms, it comes from the Greek homo uh, means similar or alike, and then morph means uh, shape again, so that's referring to the structure. So it's saying a uh, similar structure. So definition 30.2, let G and H be groups. A function phi from G to H is a homomorphism of groups if and only if phi of A times B equals phi of A times phi of B for all A, B, in G. And then there are some subtypes of homomorphisms. So a monomorphism is an injective homomorphism, an epimorphism is a surjective homomorphism, and an isomorphism is a bijective homomorphism. And then there's another little definition down here. Um, if phi from G to G prime is an epimorphism, I don't know why I misspelled this both times here, <laughs> but if phi from G to G prime is an epimorphism, we call G prime a homomorphic image of G. So if your homomorphism in fact does map onto all of the elements of the codomain G prime, then G prime is the homomorphic image of G. In other words, it's the, the image under that map of G. And since the map is a homomorphism, then it's the homomorphic image. Okay, so here's an activity for us to try to learn a little bit about uh, homomorphisms. So go ahead and give this a try, and then we'll go over it. Okay, let's go ahead and go over this. Determine whether each of the following functions is a homomorphism from G to H. If a function is a homomorphism, decide whether it is a monomorphism, an epimorphism, an isomorphism, or none of these. Okay, so let's get started here. So um, here's what we're actually trying to check. So we're trying to check whether the following is true. So phi of A plus B equals phi of A plus phi of I don't like this phi, I'm gonna do that again. Okay, so I'm using addition on both sides because both the integers and z5 um, are additive groups. The integers is not a group under multiplication, of course, because zero does not have a multiplicative inverse. So you know that's addition there. So we're checking whether this is true um, for all a, b in the domain, which is gonna be uh, z. Okay, so let's just check the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that equation and see whether they match up. Okay, so phi of a plus b, that is going to be defined as the congruence class of a plus b mod 5. And then the right-hand side of the equation, what would that be? So phi of a plus phi of b, that's going to be the congruence class of a mod 5 plus the congruence class of b mod 5. And indeed, we can smush those together into one um, element like that. Um, so yes, this is. Now let's think about, um, is this injective, surjective, uh, both or neither? So it's definitely not injective for the following reasons. So it's not injective, well for one thing the um, domain is much larger than the codomain, right? But for example you can find elements that map onto the same element. Um, so for example, um, well, uh, 2 and 7 in Z have that uh, phi of 2 is the congruence class of 2 mod 5, and also um, phi of 7 is congruence class of 7 mod 5, which is the same as the congruence class of 2 mod 5. So it's definitely not injective. Um, is it surjective? Yeah, it's definitely surjective. So we can definitely hit all five of those congruence classes. Um, for example, I'll show you five elements, um, just one, two, three, four, and five would map onto um, the congruence classes, uh, one, two, three, four, and um, zero. Okay, so it's definitely surjective. Um, so this is an epimorphism. All right, let's look at part B. 
So the uh, domain is z3 and the codomain is z18 and then our map is um, multiplying by six. Okay, so let's check if this preserves the group structure. So we wanna know the following. Uh, these are both additive groups again. So we wanna know if phi of a, um, this time I'm writing them in brackets because they're gonna come from z3. So if I have a plus b in going into phi like that, is that the same as putting a and b into phi separately and then adding afterwards? For all a and b congruence classes in z3. So that's what we're checking. So let's do the left hand side. So if I do phi of a plus b, what do I get? I think I get um, six times a plus b in parentheses like that, um, modulo 18. And then when I do the right hand side, I get phi of a plus phi of b, and that is gonna be 6a mod 18 plus 6b mod 18. And indeed I can um, smush those together and factor out the six and get the same thing. Um, so yes, that does preserve the structure. And then um, is it an isomorphism, or sorry, is it an epimorphism, monomorphism, or isomorphism? In other words, is it injective, surjective, or bijective? So I don't think it's going to be surjective. I mean, the domain is too small, right? But it might be injective. So let's just check um, on injective. Um, so let's see where those three elements get mapped to. Do they go to different places? So if I plug in zero mod three, I get um, zero mod 18, six times zero, zero. And then if I plug in one mod three, I get uh, six mod 18. And then if I plug in two mod three, I get 12 mod 18. So yeah, those are three different elements. So yes, it's injective. And then finally, surjective, um, like I said, it can't be because the domain is too small. So the domain is smaller than codomain. So there just aren't enough elements to hit everything in the codomain. Um, so no. Okay, so this is a monomorphism. Okay. All right, let's do the third one. So G this time is Z, and then H is the external direct product of Z2 and Z4. And our map is, of course, given in terms of an ordered pair because that external direct product, its elements are ordered pairs. Okay, so let's give this a try. So let's check, um, does, um, so let's see, let's see, does phi of, I'll call them K and J, I guess. Um, so our operations here are addition again. So does phi of K plus J equal phi of K plus phi of J for all K, J in the integers? Okay, so let's look at what the left-hand side would look like. So phi of k plus j is going to be, uh, let's see, so it's going to be uh, brackets is going to have k plus j inside, and then mod 2, and then the other one, k plus j mod 4. Okay, and then the right-hand side, so phi of k plus phi of j. So this is going to be just k first, and then another ordered pair with just um, J. And then you remember the way the uh, addition of ordered pairs works in the external direct product is you just add them element wise. So I add the first two elements and then I add the last two elements. So yeah, indeed, this is going to be um, the same. Oops. Okay, so yes, this is a homomorphism. And then let's think about whether it's injective, uh, surjective, or bijective. So it definitely can't be inductive, and that is because the domain is larger than the codomain. So everything can't go to its own element because there's too many things in the domain. 
that codomain only has eight elements. Um, now, is it surjective? Um, I believe it is going to be surjective. Um, well, actually, no, it can't be, can it? Because you have to have the same element. You have to have k in both places, the, the first element and the, left, the last element in the um, ordered pair. Um, so actually, no, it's not going to be surjective. Um, so it's not surjective because, for example, um, we can't reach uh, this ordered pair 0 and 1, right? There's no way to reach that because you have to have, you have, to have k in both places. Um, okay, so this is not um, a monomorphism, an epimorphism, or an isomorphism. So none of the special types. Okay, let's look at part D. So our codomain and our domain are the same here. It's the positive real numbers. Um, so I presume that we are doing um, multiplication because that would be a group under multiplication. And it would not be a group under um, addition because you'd be missing the additive identity of zero. Um, so we must be using multiplication. Okay, uh, so our question, first of all, for checking the structure and whether the structure is preserved is does phi of, um, I'll just call it j, I guess, kj, does that equal phi of k times phi of j for all real numbers, uh, positive real numbers, k and j? Uh, so let's just check. So the left-hand side is going to look like this. So phi of kj will be the square root of kj. Okay, and then the right-hand side is going to be phi of k times phi of j. So that'll be square root of k times square root of j, which indeed is the same as the square root of both of them. Um, so yes. Now, is this going to be injective or surjective? I actually think that it is both, um, because if I'm thinking about the graph of the the square root function, so let me just justify it like this. Um, both injective and surjective cause, so let me just sketch the graph of this. So this is r plus and this is r plus, positive reals, and then of course it's not gonna go right there at the origin, but then it'll just go up you know, like that. So there's nowhere on there where you get two x values that have the same y value, and also it covers all of the positive real numbers with the y values. Um, so the graph um, is strictly increasing. Um, so no y value has more than one x value and the graph covers all y values in the reals, uh, positive reals. Of course you could do like a, a proof of this, but I'm just gonna explain it like this. Um, okay. All right, so last thing, let's look at part E here. So our function is from the um, units in Z12, U12, um, to Z6, and the function definition is pretty simple. So just to remind you what um, U12 is, that is all of the elements that are relatively primed to 12. So it's going to be 1, um, 5, well, what else is there, 7, and then 11, and I think that's all of them. Uh, so just those four elements there, and then it's under multiplication. So we have multiplication for G and addition for H. So the thing that we're going to be checking here is um, we want to know whether phi of, um, I'm going to use brackets here, phi of A times B. So that is the G operation. G operation is equal to phi of A plus phi of B. And the reason I'm using addition on the right is because that is the um, z6 operation. Okay, so u12 operation is uh, multiplication and z6 operation is addition. Okay, so let's just check. Oh, and that'll be for all um, congruence classes a and b in 
U12. Okay, so the left hand side is going to look like this. Oops, well, that looks squarish. Okay, um, so that is going to be. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So I'm going to have to combine those into one um, congruence class like that. And then this is just going to be AB mod 6. And then the right hand side, I'm going to have congruence class of A um, plus congruence class of B. Oh, I already see this is not going to work, right? Because multiplication is different than addition. Um, so this is going to be A mod 6 plus B mod 6. So, no. All right, that's all, guys. Um, so I'll see you next time. It was a little bit long today, but uh, next time, hopefully not so long. Um, let me know if you're having any troubles with the homeworks or the test. And uh, yeah, I'll see you later.